I've had the great privilege of living across three different countries in three different continents over my 17 years of life so far. I was originally born in Hamburg, Germany, where my family and I resided for about 10 years before we made the big move down to Cape Town, South Africa, where we spent another four years. After that, we made another big jump, but this time over the Atlantic to New York, where I am now. But as many of you might be able to see, there is another location marker down in Miami, Florida. That is because originally I only spent my eighth grade here, here at Browning, before completing my freshman and sophomore years down in Miami at St. Andrew's School. Ultimately, we did realize as a family, though, that Browning is where I want to graduate, and New York is where we really belong, so here I am. Typically, when I mention these four big cities to friends of mine or relatives, these are the kind of images that pop into their mind. Hamburg in the top left, Cape Town in the top right, Miami in the bottom left, and as you can all guess, New York City in the bottom right. Now, these are the typical kind of postcard images that you would expect to see in a travel magazine or something of sorts. But having seen these images in person and having experienced the atmosphere in these, in these different places, I've also been lucky to experience, well, the less fortunate sides that come with almost every city, as I've learned. It seems that no matter how fancy a city is over the world, there always seems to be one area that's less fortunate and less glam glamorous than the rest where you can find all the tourists. I consider myself lucky to have been able to, to experience these different places early on because I learned two major things. First of all, I learned to appreciate what I have today. I learned to appreciate the value of the education that I've experienced, the value of being able to live in all these different places and only being 17 years old. And I've just learned to appreciate me as a person. The second thing that I learned, though, was that while we may be so different, especially in a society today, and we may be so separated by where we are in terms of our economic status, how much we own, how much wealth we are surrounded by, there is one thing which really does connect all of us all over the world. And I found that to be technology. Now, some of you might think, and this was me included early on, that people, for example, in the townships of Cape Town might not have the same access to handheld technology, especially children, that we do here over in the United States and we consider completely all ordinary. Well, as it turns out, I've experienced firsthand that these kids have just as much access to technology as we do. The thing is though, and here's the difference, that technology rather brings people together in Cape Town and unifies them as one people, whereas I've personally experienced it to divide us apart in a place such as New York City. Overall, many people might think that just because we are surrounded with all this wealth, all this technology, especially in a place such as here like New York City, shouldn't people automatically be much happier? I mean, in a city such as New York, we have access to virtually everything anyone could imagine. Well, as it turns out, the reported levels of in uh, happiness are actually dramatically higher in low to middle income countries where this wealth of technology certainly does not exist as much as it does here compared to the rich ones, such as the United States. Now, before I get into kind of my personal experience with this and why, what I believe to be the root of the problem, I just want to talk about the technology situation today, especially among teenagers. It's almost worrying to see that almost 60% of 12-year-olds already have their, smart, their first smartphone, and that number only increases the older teenagers get. As we can see, it's above 80% for 16 and 17-year-olds. But that in itself is not the problem. The real problem comes here. 50% of all these smartphone-owning teenagers are completely addicted to their devices. And out of this addiction, we see depressive episodes. Already in kids as young as 12 years, 4%. This number only gets higher the older teenagers get. And if we look at 16 and 17 year olds, almost 12% of these smartphone addicted teenagers already suffer from depressive episodes. So you may ask, what do we see on these phones? What do we see on the smartphones that makes this happen? I mean, owning a phone within itself can't be the problem here. And you're right, it isn't. The problem is social media. Now, not even that in itself is the problem. It's what we're exposed to on social media. 
I myself, I'm not going to lie, I'm a frequent social media user. I am a part of the 67% of teenagers that clock in on social media at least once a day. I do. And uh, to be honest, I probably also consider myself addicted to the smartphone. But that is not what causes the depressive episodes. And that in itself is not really what causes technology to be such a divider over here and such a connector in a place like Cape Town. What I saw in Cape Town, and I actually experienced this when I got my very first phone. I remember it was a BlackBerry Bowl. To some of the kids in the room right now, and they might not even know what a BlackBerry is. But uh, a BlackBerry, like any of the iPhones that we own today, it gave me unparalleled access to social media, the internet, text messages, phone calls with all of my friends whenever I wanted and wherever I wanted. Now, rather than letting social media dictate my life in Cape Town, though, and rather than letting social media influence me, who I am as a person, and set unrealistic standards for who I should be compared to other people out there, I, dicted, I, I dictated the way that social media would dictate me. But the big impact and the big change that I really witnessed was my transition from Cape Town to New York. It didn't take me a lot of time to notice that in New York, social media has a huge impact on teenage kids, especially in a school such as this, or schools, uh, well, really just around the country that are like Browning. I've realized that brands such as Supreme, Gucci, Off-White, I've personally seen them take over millennial minds and gain huge amount of support, especially among teenage, teenagers. I remember in Cape Town, when I lived there, I didn't even know about these brands. It took me less than a week to learn about the impact that these brands have on the kids here when I arrived in New York. Now, the problem with that, once again, is not the brand in itself. Of course, it's fine for brands to do marketing, and why would they not target teenagers? The problem in itself is when we have people like these, a 70, Lil Pump, a 17-year-old rapper, a high school dropout that is now worth millions. And these are the type of people that send unrealistic standards for our kids today. I mean, to be honest, what kind of child wouldn't want to ever dream about being a 17-year-old teenager that is already worth millions and just spending his days releasing rap songs to the public and living a good life? Well, of course, this is an unrealistic standard. The, the percentage of people that can achieve this is most definitely drastically low. And the chance of you being one of these people is slim to none. So what do I think? Oh, Sorry about that. What do I think is the solution here? How do I think we can make sure that technology does not separate us here in a place such as New York and rather connects us, which is what technology was originally meant to do. The first, first phone was meant to connect people. It was allowed, meant to allow you to connect with your peers, your friends, to, 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 to network, to do things like that. A smartphone was never really invented to take control of your life. You have control of your smartphone, not the other way around. But um, I found a very interesting clip from a documentary about Bob Marley who can explain this appreciation that kids should really have for themselves better than I ever could. Have you made a lot of money out of your music? Money? I mean, what is, how, much is, how much is a lot of money to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Have, have you made, say, millions of dollars? No. Are you a rich man? What do you mean rich? What do you mean? You have a lot of possessions, a lot of well, money in the bank. Possession make you rich? I don't, I don't have that type of richness. My richness is life forever. Now, that last sentence is what you, I would like you guys to remember. Bob Marley said his richness is life. And that's what's important here. That is why technology connects the kids in Cape Town and divides us here. I've seen the kids in Cape Town, the ones even in the townships outside of Cape Town, the kids that have a smartphone there, they appreciate who they are and they don't let the smartphone dictate their lives. They are in control of their device and they don't let social media influence and set unrealistic standards for who they're supposed to be. Now I believe that if parents can have, well, parents have a huge influence first of all over the kids obviously, but if parents can kind of set the standards for this level of appreciation that kids should really have for themselves, then I believe that we can solve the issue of the division, the split in society which technology creates here. So if I can leave you with one thing today, it is don't educate your children to be rich, but educate them to be happy so that they know the value of things and not the price. 
Because when things, when kids understand the value of an item and the value, most importantly, of who they are as a person, who they are meant to be, not some unrealistic image on social media, then they will realize all that stuff out there, that's nonsense. They don't need that. Thank you.